Welcome to Lecture Online, and here we're going to talk about what we would call the probability density function, or simply said, the probability density. So in previous videos, we try and understand how an electron moves, for example, in a confined space of a box. And we already discovered that electrons are more like waves than they are particles, but they're not pure waves. They're not like a, uh, an electromagnetic wave, because those don't have any mass, and electrons are particles, they do have mass, so there's a subtle difference between them, one that is actually very important here. So again, let's assume that a particle is moving back and forth in a one-dimensional box. Of course, one-dimensional boxes don't really exist because for a box to exist, it has to have two dimensions. So this is, again, a mathematical conscript of what we're trying to understand here. But assuming a particle moves back like an electron, back and forth, it can only move back and forth like a wave, just like when an electron goes around an orbit around a hydrogen atom, it has to go around it in the form of a wave, such that when it goes and does one complete revolution around the orbit, it has to then travel a distance of at least one wavelength, or two wavelengths, or three wavelengths, not just at least, but exactly, because the orbit cannot be one and a half, or three quarters, or a third of a wavelength, because an electron cannot exist. So we do realize electrons have to move like waves. So this is what a wave pattern would look like in its ground state, in its first energized state, in its second energized states, and so forth, because in higher energy states, the wave pattern of the electron will look differently like that. But the wave itself, and by the way, this is the wave equation now that defines the existence of the wave pattern by the electron. But since an electron is a particle, it's not really a wave, it acts like a wave, this doesn't describe actually where you will find the particle at any point in time. So it's not like an, ele like an electron will have amplitude, a wave does, but an electron doesn't. So how do we really describe the existence of an electron in a particular path? So later on we're going to use this to describe how electrons move in orbits around the hydrogen atom. But in the meanwhile, let's do a simplistic case, such as a particle moving in a box. So we then realize that if we take the wave function of the electron in a box and we square that, we will then get what we call the probability density. So the probability density is equal to the wave function squared. So we take the wave function, the function that describes the movement of the electron in a confined space, just like later on we'll talk about the confined space of a hydrogen atom, then if we square that, we have what we call the probability density, or the probability density function. So what does that represent? Well, the probability density, the wave function squared, actually describes where you're most likely to find the electron in that confined space. For example, later on we want to try to figure out where we're we going to find the electron in an orbit around the hydrogen atom. And as we learn, it can be in different states, so we'll learn all the various combinations of the different states. Now let's take this equation and square it. So that means if we take the, the wave function, which is of course a function of position in the x direction, and we square that, well let's square that number right there, we get 2 divided by L times the sine squared of n pi x over L. This is now telling us the probability of where in the x direction we're most likely to find the particle. And it turns out, notice that if the position for x, if we put a zero there, we get the sine squared of zero. Well, what is the sine squared of zero? Well, the sine of zero is zero, which means when x is equal to zero, we have zero probability of finding an electron there. If we plug in the value for l there, so l divided by l is one, so we just get the sine squared of n times pi. Now, n has to be an integer number. It can be 1, it can be 2, it can be 3. So it's a multiple of pi. So now we know that if the angle is pi, the sine of pi is 0. If the angle is 2 pi, the sine of 2 pi is 0. If it's 3 pi, the sine of 3 pi is 0. In other words, if we put the, the particle, the electron, on the far end of the box, where x equals l, the length of the box, and I should, of course, indicate, that L is simply the length of the box, like that. So if I, if I make x equal to L, I find out that sine of zero, uh, sine of pi or sine of two pi or sine of three pi is zero as well, which means there's zero, zero probability to find a particle there, which we illustrated right there. So there's zero probability at the edge of the box. Then we find that if we, we find the position of the, the electron somewhere in the middle of the box, the probability goes up with the maximum probability at the halfway point, halfway between the left side and the right side of the box. 
So squaring this function simply gives us the probability of where we are likely to find the electron with the highest probability right in the middle. If we now want to calculate the actual probability for the electron being a certain range, all we have to do is plug in the value for x there and then plug in the value for x plus a small change in x and in that range we, we will be able to figure out how much probability there is to find the electron there. Notice that there's a 100% probability we find it somewhere between 0 and L. So how much probability is it to find the electron in this small little range? Well, all we have to do is take the density function, the probability density here, and multiply it times the width of that range, and that will give us the probability of finding it there. For example, if I say I want to be able to find it from x equal a to x equal b, x equal b here and x equal a, what if I want to find the probability of finding it in this range right here? I want to find, in essence, the area underneath that curve. So the probability of finding it between a and b is equal to the integral of the probability function, the probability density function, I should call it, squared, so that's phi squared, that's a, that's a function phi squared, times dx, and integrate it from A to B. And that will give us the probability of finding it in that particular range. Of course, if you set A equal to, or A equal to zero, and B equals to L, then it's the whole probability, and of course, this will be equal to one. In other words, the probability of finding it somewhere between uh, zero and L, I guess I should write it like that, is equal to the integral from zero to L of the density function, dx, and of course, at that point we realize that is going to have to be equal to 100% or equal to 1, so that's where that comes from. So, it doesn't take a lot of, it doesn't make a lot of sense, or it actually doesn't make any sense to talk about electrons existing according to this equation. This simply represents the way an electron uh, behaves or acts in orbits or in confined spaces. It doesn't tell us anything really physically about the electron, and this is where we have to make a big distinction. This is simply a mathematical equation saying electrons behave like waves, but they're not waves, they're still particles. And so therefore, to find out where you would likely find the electron, you have to take the wave function, square it, which gives you the probability density function, and then you can start talking about how much probability do I have for the electron to exist between this little range, that little range, or that little range, and so forth. So it's simply taking the density function, multiplying times a small little dx, and then integrating it from left to right, however big a function or a big region you want to consider. Now also notice that if the electron goes to a different energy state, its wave pattern will have to look different, because therefore the, the wave has to the wave pattern has to adjust to the dimensions of the box at a higher energy state. Therefore, the corresponding density will, or density function will change as well. So in this case, you can see that there's high probability the electron can be here or here, zero probability there, there, and there. At the next higher energy state, the probability of finding the electron here, here, and here is much higher, and it's zero here, 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 and here. It's basically like if you look at the nodes and antinodes of a wave pattern, of a standing wave pattern, where you have an antinode, which would be here, that's where you have the highest probability of finding the electron. Where there's nodes at the standing wave pattern, there's zero probability of finding the electron there. So that's the principle that we use to define the existence of electron in orbits around atoms. Here we have a simplistic example in just simply a, a linear, or I should say a linear box or one dimensional box. And so the idea then is to, in the future, we're going to set up equations that will describe the likelihood of finding electrons around orbits around the nucleus, which then will define the shape of the orbitals where electrons can exist in. So we'll go ahead and start developing that now in the next so many videos. We'll start talking about the energy levels. Those are called the shells. Then we'll talk about the subshells, which are determined by the angular momentum of the, of the particle. Then we'll talk about the subdivision of the subshells, which are the individual orbitals in those subshells, and so forth. So that will all start making sense when we start talking about the existence of an electron behaving like a wave, but 
being defined by the probability or likelihood of where we can find it, depending upon the physical constraints of the orbits and the forces around the orbits, the electrical forces, magnetic forces, and so forth. So we're all starting to put this together. So in the next several videos, we're going to start developing how we define the existence of electrons and orbits around the nucleus of an atom.